Welcome to lecture 4.6, Generalized Eigenspaces. We will continue to assume that K is an algebraically closed field and X is an n-dimensional vector space over K. Last time, we proved the spectral theorem and we stated it in terms of generalized eigenspaces, something that we defined at the end of last lecture. Namely, if A is a linear map, then X decomposes as a direct sum of these generalized eigenspaces, e lambda 1 up to e lambda k, and these are just the union of the null spaces of a minus lambda j i to the m. It's hard to understand what this really means just from the algebraic definition, so we motivated it with a running example that has appeared in a number of lectures, which is a linear map with characteristic polynomial t minus lambda to the n and four genuine eigenvectors. Let's recap how we did that. We took four generalized eigenvectors that are linearly independent. In other words, they get mapped to zero. We claimed that we could always find preimages of at least some of these under a minus lambda i. So let's say that v2, w2, and x2 are preimages. Now, I should actually be careful with what I'm saying. It's not necessarily true that if I take any four linearly independent vectors, v1 up to y1, that I can find preimages for three of them. But what is true is that I can find a basis, in this case, that's going to have preimages for, for three of them. And then we can keep going. These things are going to have preimages or at least one of them will, v3 and w3, and at least one of these will have a preimage. Let's call that v4, and then finally v5. Now remember, we have not actually proven that the generalized eigenvectors have this structure. All we have proven in this particular case is that there is a basis of 11 generalized eigenvectors. And one thing that could be possible is that maybe v1, w1, x1, y1 are all, I, or are all genuine eigenvectors, so they all get mapped to zero, and maybe there are seven more eigenvectors, let's say v1 prime all the way up to v, I don't know, you know v2 prime all the way up to v2 to the seven prime, maybe, maybe there are seven things that get mapped to v1, and the generalized eigenspace structure looks like this. Turns out this is not going to be the case. Uh, but we have not yet proven it, and that's what we will do in this lecture. So what we will do is we will explicitly construct a basis that looks like this. We will also see why the generalized eigenspace structure determines the similarity class of A. So you can imagine all possible diagrams like this with 11 generalized eigenvectors. So this, this one in particular has chains of length 5, 3, 2, and 1, and I claim that two linear maps are going to be similar if and only if, for all eigenvalues, these generalized eigenvalue vector chains are going to, up to reordering, have the same length. One more thing I want to say, now that I have this picture up here, is that even though I motivated this idea as starting from the right and pulling back and finding preimages, um, we will actually construct this basis from the right to the left. And part of that is because the technicality that I said, if you get, take any four independent vectors, you can't necessarily find preimages for all of them. Maybe none of them will have preimages. So it's not necessarily clear how to find such vectors that have preimages. So we will start, in this case, with V5, which is, is going to be, so V5 is, is in N5. And now N5, remember, is the null space of A minus lambda I to the 5. So we'll start with this, and we'll map it to something in N4, um, and then go from there. Well, it's going to be slightly different. We will actually start with a V5 bar in N5 mod N4, because this will be a one-dimensional vector space. We'll map it to the right and continue. Our goal in this slide is to show that generalized eigenspaces characterize similarity. So let's suppose that A is a linear map with eigenvalue lambda of degree d lambda. Remember the degree is the length 
of the longest chain. For each positive integer m, define nm of lambda to be the null space of a minus lambda i to the m. Remember our previous running example where the characteristic polynomial is t minus lambda to the 11, we defined nj to be the null space of a minus lambda i to the j, and we wrote, and so we had n1, which was properly contained in n2, which was properly contained in n3, which was properly contained in n4, and so forth. The only difference here is that we might be dealing with multiple eigenvalues, so we need to be clear as to which ni this is. So this is n, so we're going to write this as n1 of lambda, this is going to be n2 of lambda, n3 of lambda, n4 of lambda, and so forth. So that's the only difference. This isn't really new notation, I'm just specifying what lambda is. And finally, we will denote e lambda to be the generalized eigenspace corresponding to that lambda. So that's just the union of all of these things. Um, assuming that x is finite dimensional, that's, we really only have to go up to d to the degree d lambda. In this case, that would be n equals 5 in our running example, though I'm going to leave it like this because if we have infinite dimensional vector spaces, as I will show you an example of involving differential equations, um, it is possible that all of these are proper, each of each n and m is properly contained in the next one. I'm also going to refer to these n j's as eigen subspaces because they are subspaces of the generalized eigenspace E lambda. As I said before, it turns out that A up to a choice of basis, or equivalently, the similarity class of A, is completely determined by the dimensions of these eigen subspaces, n1 up to nd for each lambda. Now, really, it's completely determined for all of these, for all integers, but this sequence of numbers, or I guess that if you look at the dimension of these, that sequence of numbers will stabilize once we get to n d lambda. To prove this, let's consider another linear map b with the same eigenvalue lambda, but now let's denote its eigen subspaces by m sub m instead of n sub n. So m m is the null space of b minus lambda i to the m. Formally, our theorem says that the linear maps a and b are similar if and only if for each eigenvalue lambda, the dimension of the eigen subspaces for a equals the dimension of the corresponding eigen subspace for b. So the dimension of nm of lambda is the dimension of m sub little m of lambda for all integers m. And, I, and notice that this implies that a and b have to have the same eigenvalues, because if lambda is an eigenvalue of one but not the other, then all of a sudden, right from the start, these are going to have different dimensions. The forward direction of this is easy. Namely, if a and b are similar, Let's say that A equals P, B, P inverse. Well, then A minus lambda I equals P, B minus lambda I, P inverse. And similarly, if we square this, so if we take A minus lambda I squared, we get P b minus lambda i, p inverse, p, b minus lambda i, p inverse, and these inner p's and p inverses cancel, and we get p, b minus lambda i squared times p inverse. So this is a general theme. If two matrices or linear maps are similar by p, then any power of them is similar by p as well. So in other words, a minus lambda i to the m 
is similar to b minus lambda i to the m. And similar maps have the same nullity. So that means precisely that the null space of a minus lambda i to the m and b minus lambda i to the m are the same for all m and all lambda. And that's what we had to show for the forward direction. The reverse implication is harder. For this, we have linear maps a and b. And all we know is that they have the same eigenvalues. And for each one, the dimension of the null space of a minus lambda i to the m is equal to the, null the dimension of the null space of b minus lambda i to the m for all m and all lambda. So what this is saying is, let's, do our, let's go back to our 11-dimensional example. So p of t is t minus lambda to the 11. And remember the dimension of these null sp So we had n1 is contained in n2, contained in n3, contained in n4, contained in n5, and then they, they stabilize. And the dimension of these were 4, 7, 9, 10, 11. So we claim that this sequence determines everything. Now, first of all, notice that this sequence determines the, ch the so-called chain structure. So if we had v1, w1, x1, y1, and all of these get... So the, the 4 here tells us that we have 4 here. The 7 here tells us that exactly three of these things have pre-images. And then the 9 here says of these three, exactly two of them have pre-images. And then the 10 says one of these does and one of these does. So this chain of numbers determines the chain structure. So what this is really saying is that if, the, if A and B have the same chain generalized eigenvector chain structure for all lambda, then they are similar. So what we will do is we will only use this sequence of numbers to construct a basis for each generalized eigenspace. So in this case, it will be a we will construct these 11 generalized eigenvectors, and we will do so, so which a minus lambda i admits a nice matrix form, or equivalently, a admits a nice matrix form. You know, a and a minus lambda i differ only by the diagonal entries. So in other words, we will, given only the structure, only the sequence of numbers, construct a nice a matrix that is similar to a or to a minus lambda i equivalently. Um, and therefore, by symmetry, b will be similar to that matrix as well. And that matrix is going to be the Jordan canonical form. So we will construct the Jordan canonical form, which we know is similar to a just from the sequence of numbers. And by symmetry, it'll also have to be similar to b from those numbers. And so by transitivity, a and b will be similar. And this is, of course, the Jordan canonical form. The key technical lemma for this basis construction is something that we saw two lectures ago, I think in lecture 4.4 in variant subspaces. So this I left as a homework exercise, but I went over it in detail. We really dissected it. It looks technical, but please watch that lecture if you have not already to really understand what this means. It says that a minus lambda i, now let me start out by saying a minus lambda i um, we know is a linear map that it sends the null space of nj plus 1 to nj. So elements in nj plus 1 are things that are killed by j plus 1 applications of a minus lambda i. So if we apply, if, if we hit one of these things with a minus lambda i, now we clearly only need j applications remaining. So it's easy to see why this, the restriction of this to nj minus 1 maps it to nj. But what this is saying is that we can also, um, it's defined on the quotient basis. So nj plus 1 mod nj, an element x bar in here, is something that, um, a non-zero element in here, is, some, is such that x gets killed by exactly j minus 1 iterations. In other words, just applying a minus lambda i j times will not do the trick. So x 
so this says that x gets mapped to a minus lambda i um, times x bar. So this one, and that, that's easy to see if you wrap your head around what it's saying. Well, this gets mapped to nj mod nj minus 1. So x, without the bar, needs exactly j minus 1 bullets, which is what I call applications of a minus lambda i. And if I apply 1 to it, now a minus lambda i times x obviously requires exactly j, and no less. Okay, so we, um, we went over this again two lectures ago. Please watch that. One of the important corollaries is that anytime we have a one-to-one -one map, the dimension of the target space is going to be at least as big as the dimension of the domain space. So the dimension, so as we move to the right, nj mod nj minus 1, we, um, the dimension of that is at least the dimension of nj plus 1 over mj, nj. Okay, so in this slide, I will give the algebraic description of this basis construction. Try to follow along and picture what it means in your head. And then in the following slide, I will give more a, a visual construction as to what this looks like in terms of those so-called chains. We will construct our basis in batches from left to right, starting with nd, or nd lambda, which is the entire eigenspace. So if you think of that picture of chains, we're going to start on the very leftmost most edge of that. And let's let x1 bar up to x l0 bar be a basis for nd mod nd minus 1. So if you think of that, that chain picture, so we have x1 up to x l0. These are the, um, you know, et cetera. These, these things will eventually get mapped to 0, and then there are other, other things might get mapped to 0. So these are the things that have no preimage. And if you, um, so nd is the set of all of these things, this space spanned by all of these, and nd minus 1 is spanned by all of these. So, um, x1 up to x. So if you take these vectors and you just take the equivalence class containing them in the quotient, then that's going to be a basis for nd mod nd minus 1. So we take these vectors and now we will apply a minus lambda i to those and we will get a, um, I'm going to call this one a1 prime and I'm going to call this one a l naught prime. And because this is, well, here's the key, because this is 1 to 1, these vectors are going to be linearly independent in nd minus 1 mod nd minus 2. Not necessarily a basis, but independent. So what we will do is we will extend this to a basis. Let's say x l naught plus 1 bar all the way up to x l 1 bar. Or I'm, I'm going to put primes here because I want to put primes on all of these. And so we extend it to a basis, and now we apply a minus lambda i again. And the key idea here is that this is one to one. So the image of these things is going to be a, I can't say a basis, but the image of these is going to be um, linearly independent in n d minus 2 mod n d minus 3. So we're going to keep doing that until we get to the, as far as we can. So that's an idea. So let's, that's the basic idea. Let's write this down algebraically, and then I will give a cleaner picture like this on the next slide. So we apply a minus lambda i to this basis, and let's call the image of the elements xj prime bar. I don't know what order to say the, the j and the prime and the bar. I think any of those is fine. x prime j bar. So, okay, so we apply this, and by this lemma, these things are linearly independent in n d minus 1 mod d n 2, d n minus 2. So we extend these to a basis, x1 prime bar up to x l1 prime bar, and we apply a minus lambda i to this basis. And now we get, let's call these things, x j double prime. Now these vectors are, the image, this is a linearly independent set 
in n d minus 2 mod n d minus 3. And we keep going. We extend this to a basis. x1 double prime bar up to x l2 double prime bar. And we just keep repeating this process until we reach the genuine eigenvectors, until these things eventually get mapped to zero. And I claim that if we take the representatives of all of these, in other words, if we take everything, all of these x, xi's that we've dealt with and we just remove the bars, then we will get a basis for um, the generalized eigenspace. So if we take, uh, so take all of these things without the bars, then we get a, a basis for E lambda. Let's now see what this construction looks like. And I will keep the key points from lemma 4.7 up here at the top. So A minus lambda I is a one-to-one -one map from nj plus 1 mod nj to nj mod nj minus 1. So in particular, the dimension of this first quotient is less than or equal to the dimension of this second quotient. We start with the basis for n d mod n d minus 1. Now I was torn here as to whether or not to keep bars on these things or not. Because remember, in our construction, we have bars because we're in the quotient space. So I really should call this n1 bar up to n l0 bar. But at the end of the day, when we're done, we are going to just look at the representatives. In other words, we remove the bars, and the diagram that we get is going to be that so-called chain diagram, that I, like what I showed you with the 11-dimensional eigenspace in the beginning. So I've decided to keep the bars off of this. Um, it's just, it makes, I think there's enough subscripts and superscripts that we don't need them. Uh, but know that when we are applying these maps, we are really doing it on the quotient rather than the vectors themselves. So we have these things in the, in the quotient n d mod n d minus 1, and we apply a minus lambda i. And here are the representatives. So in the quotient space, these guys are literally independent. Well, they're independent they're independent vectors in nj, but also in the quotient nj mod nj minus 1. So we extend this to a basis of the quotient. So really, think about having bars on here if you prefer, but again, I just don't want to write all of them. So here we have a basis um, in the quotient, and we apply a minus lambda i again. And now what we get is a linearly independent set in the next quotient. So what is this? This is n d minus 2 mod n d minus 3, assuming that we are looking at the, the uh, equivalence classes. And we just keep going with this. So we extend this to a basis. We apply a minus lambda i. And eventually, we will get to the genuine eigenvectors. And here they are. So now we have. Um, x1 to the d, so this is d prime, so our notation is like calculus. You know, when we have more than three primes, we usually put it in parentheses, all the way up to L, x sub L2 of d, and, and we actually should be going, so this is L2, this, this really should be going down further. Along this way, we've extended to a basis. Um, basically, uh, however far we've gotten, we, we can extend this thing all the way up to what I'm going to call L x sub ld to the d prime. So now we have our full set of genuine eigenvectors for lambda. And we apply a minus lambda i. And those things get sent to 0. So the last step of this process was we are taking all of these vectors that appear in here. And we claim that these things are linearly independent. And they, and you could, and they are by, by construction. And that is our basis of eigenvectors for the generalized eigenspace E lambda. So two linear maps, A and B, are similar if and only if this diagram looks the same for every single eigenvalue lambda. Now that said, 
the last couple lectures, I've really made a deal about these generalized eigenvectors. And it is kind of funny because most matrices that we come up with don't have repeated eigenvalues. And even if they do, they sometimes they have, you know, they don't have a deficient set of eigenvectors. So this is not as common as we make it out to be, but it still, I think, is really worth uh, hammering down because up until this point, you've likely heard that, well, if you have distinct eigenvalues, you have a full set of a basis of eigenvectors. But what happens if you don't have a full set of eigenvectors? And the answer is this. You can extend your basis to a basis of generalized eigenvectors, and that is the spectral theorem. Okay, so I think we're going to leave it there. Coming up next, we'll talk about the Jordan canonical form. And I've already dropped this these ideas throughout the last few lectures, and so you should know that when you look at this set of chains, what's happening is every single one of these horizontal chains, the matrix form is a Jordan block. So it's lambda, it's going to have lambdas on the diagonal and one above that. And so we will interpret the spectral theorem and this similarity theorem um, in terms of matrices. And then we will look at what we can say when linear maps commute. And in fact, we will say that if A and B commute, that they will share a common basis of generalized eigenvectors. And in the case when they are, diagonal, or when they are diagonalizable, that leads to the notion of them being simultaneously diagonalizable. And that is a mouthful. Okay, so I hope you stick around.